The evolution of life on Earth determined the existence of two sexes, and since then males and females have combined their genes in order to reproduce. But the females often have to do almost all the work, and in addition are mistakenly referred to as the weak sex. Different animals have adopted different strategies and relations between males and females, but the common denominator is that both want to pass on their genes and have the healthiest possible children. The difference lies in the fact that the males have small, abundant sexual cells which are produced continuously. The females, on the other hand, possess the valuable, scarce and enormous ovules. All subsequent inequalities stem from this basic difference. The ovule is large because it contains considerable reserves, important substances for the development of the embryo. The sperm, in contrast, arrives empty-handed. It contributes its genes and leaves the rest of the work to the ovule, now transformed into an embryo. This, in principle, means the male can simply disappear after copulating, leaving the female in charge while he goes off in search of more females to inseminate. But it does not always happen that way. Often the male stays to help bring up his children, and at the top of the evolutionary scale, this acquires complex connotations. When the female in question is a woman, things should be different, and yet in the majority of the world, they quite simply aren't. In almost all cultures, women have always been oppressed in one way or another. In male hominids, natural selection favored the characteristics of a fighter and protector, making them big and strong, while in females, the emphasis was on cooperation and child rearing. So, from a biological point of view, the physical supremacy of men is quite correct. But we are also cultural beings, and what 30,000 years ago was extremely useful for survival is today simply an injustice. Human culture, instead of compensating for the biological fact that reproductive responsibilities are largely borne by women, has taken advantage of the greater strength of the male to establish a historic patriarchy. There can be no denying that men and women are different, but not as much as social traditions would have us believe. Discrimination against women is, unfortunately, one of the few features that virtually all the cultures of the world have in common. The possessors of the valuable, scarce ovules end up being lovers, wives, mothers, educators, cooks, gatherers, artisans, and, all too often, martyrs. Nonetheless, the biological system was well designed. The family functioned as a social unit, and human beings colonized the entire planet. What strategies did other animal species adopt? There are such curious cases as that of the ostrich. When the breeding season arrives, both males and females actively participate in courtship. The male will already have dug a number of shallow holes in the ground, and when he has inseminated the females, they will lay up to 20 eggs in these nests for him to incubate. One of the females will help him, but the rest can then forget about their children for a while.
When the chicks of all the females have been born, the male and the different mothers take turns to protect them. It's very unusual among birds for females to deliberately take care of the eggs of others, but the system benefits everyone. The fact is that there are many animal species in which the males and females have an almost perfect relationship, sometimes taken to poignant extremes, as for example, here in Africa. The dictic are antelopes the size of a hare which mate for life. The system is called the strategy of conjugal fidelity, and in it the females choose the males, forcing them to perform a long, grueling courtship until they have given sufficient proof of perseverance and fidelity. In Africa, it is said that when one dies, it won't be long before its mate follows it. However, the most common mating strategy is very different. Biologists call it the strategy of the virile male. In those species that adopt it, such as this Indian rhinoceros, the females are resigned to receiving no help from the father of their children, and instead devote all their energy to finding the best genes. The females only allow a few males to reproduce. They want only the best genes, practicing sexual selection and forcing the males to compete against each other. The consequence of this strategy is that over time the males become bigger and more powerful, but also more selfish. The strategy of the virile male has filled the world with males anxious to copulate, capable of performing the most spectacular demonstrations of strength. The few that manage to reproduce end up exhausted, and that is the sum total of their contribution as fathers. They go off, leaving all the work to the females. And this system perpetuates itself. This female right whale can't complain that her son is like his father, because she herself chose him. Attractive, enormous, capable of making enormous leaps, but a complete loss when it comes to contributing to the family. This female and the male that copulated with her each contributed 50% of the genetic makeup of the calf. Then the male hands her the bill for all the time and effort he had invested in fighting and overcoming his rivals. In accordance with this biological pact, she must now pay the price for the genes of a winner, assuming full responsibility for the care and education of their mutual child. The southern or South Atlantic right whale gives birth to a calf every three years. Here in the protected waters of the Valdez Peninsula in Argentina, the young whales learn different techniques from their mothers before they both have to return to the open sea to find food. Until the calf reaches the age of six months, the mother will eat nothing because these shallow waters do not contain the plankton she needs. But the fact that some female mammals spend so much time taking care of their young means that during this period they do not mate with the males. And some of them may lose patience and give in to the temptation to kill the young, so the mother will again come into heat. Not only does the female grizzly bear have to bring up her children all alone, she also has to be careful to avoid all contact with the adult males prowling around the area. And in this part of Alaska, there are a lot of them. The mother will teach her young where and how to find food, who their enemies are, and how a grizzly bear lives. Meanwhile, the large solitary males weighing up to 600 kilos are desperate to find females willing to mate. And if they aren't, then he knows what to do to make them. Though it might not seem so, the life of these cubs will not be at all easy if they are male. From the moment their mother stops protecting them, 
They will go through hell. They will then have to compete against the big boys, and victory will go only to the strongest. In the meantime, they can enjoy one of the happiest childhoods in the animal kingdom. Bears love playing. The biological differences between male and female mammals can very clearly be seen in one of the most common reproductive strategies, the harem. This male impala is the only one authorized to copulate with all the females of his herd, but during the time he is the leader, his life will be one of constant stress. All of the little ones are his children, and one day one of them will take his place. He produces millions of sperm every day, and is capable of making all the females pregnant in very little time whereas the does can only have one child at a time. The inequality stems from the very nature of their reproductive cells. On the other hand, all the females copulate and procreate, whereas only a few males manage to do so, and at an extremely high price. Being male is not as easy as it may first seem. These Australian emus go one step further. As they are birds, the females do not have to carry the embryo inside their bodies as the impalas do. They can leave their future offspring well protected inside the egg in the care of their fathers. He built the nest and will incubate the eggs without eating or drinking for 56 days. Many females go off to copulate with other males, while a few remain behind to defend them while they are incubating. When the chicks hatch, the male will be with them for the next seven months. Responsible fatherhood, without a doubt. But the greatest example of the liberated female is this animal, the Australian brush turkey. It is related to the turkeys and capacayes, and the males build nests of up to four tons in weight, piling vegetable matter up to form a heap up to one meter high. The females approach the enormous nest, and after mating with the owner, bury their eggs in it, then simply march off, never to return. Several females lay their eggs in the same nest, and the male takes care of them all. The most curious thing is that the decomposition of this heap of dead leaves produces sufficient heat to incubate the eggs. The male adds or removes vegetable matter to maintain a constant temperature of between 30 and 35 degrees centigrade. Sticking his head inside, his beak and tongue act as a thermometer, telling him what he should do. The females, meanwhile, happily feed with never a thought for the future of their offspring. Dawn is breaking in this village in the north of Laos, very close to the Chinese border. The Ekor are people who live from subsistence agriculture, like so many others in the world. From the early hours of the morning, the only people working are the women. They carry the water from miles away, grind the rice, take care of the children, and still manage to dress elegantly in their traditional costumes as they go about their daily tasks. The majority of the human population of the world is rural and poor, but they have another thing in common. The women not only play the role of mothers, but also carry out the hardest work. When did this inequality begin? Why is it accepted virtually everywhere in the world? 
Men and women, it is true, are of different size and physical strength, though biologically women are stronger. The evolutionary reason for the strength of the male is defense in competition. Defending the group is a dangerous job, and it would seem logical that evolution has reserved it for the men, saving the women who have a more important mission. But both hunting and defense are no longer necessary in the majority of human societies. Wild animals no longer pose a threat to the children, and cattle rearing has made hunting by and large obsolete. The males have seen how their duties have diminished, while the females took on more and more tasks. The pact has been broken, the balance is no longer fair. And what is more, women are shut away inside the home, unable to take part in public life and adult culture. Hope lies in the new generations. Children are the key. Here in the Ivory Coast, as in so many other places around the world, the women are in charge of educating the little ones in their culture from the time they are born. As they go about their daily chores, they teach the children the strictures of the Senufo culture to which they belong. The children also learn from direct observation, and what they see are men sitting around and women working. If it is not changed from the very beginning, you can't blame this young boy if in the future his behavior is determined by what he has always seen, the memories of his childhood. Just like the whale calf of the bear cubs, human children need lengthy preparation in the company of adults in order to learn to be men or women. Education is the basis of the struggle against discrimination. The women of the third world, condemned to one pregnancy after another, have no opportunity to take decisions on their own lives. Often the first child comes too early in their lives, and there is then no respite until the last one is born, and then it is too late. This affects their health and that of their children. Recent studies have demonstrated the profound relationship between education and family planning. Equality between men and women can only be achieved if women are, in part at least, freed from their biological burden on the basis of cultural solidarity. But often to achieve this, they have to fight against very deep-rooted customs and cultures. The most terrible example of this is the ablation of the clitoris, a barbarous mutilation that affects over 70 million women throughout Africa. These young girls in the Ivory Coast have spent a period of isolation in the forest, learning the traditional codes of the women's secret societies, the precepts of initiation for contact with the spirits, and the rules on how to be good wives and mothers. After this, they are subjected to gentle mutilation and now dance before the high chiefs who preside over the act, dressed in white to symbolize their direct contact with the protective spirits. They're examining the girls to ensure they have been properly instructed in the discipline of the secrets of the women's societies. These older women went through the same thing and now defend the practice of ablation. Many governments and associations are trying to end this custom, which moreover is performed in appalling sanitary conditions, causing hemorrhages, infections and subsequent problems in giving birth. But for these ethnic groups, it is difficult to separate mutilation from all the other associated beliefs and rites. They all form part of their spiritual world, and in that, outsiders have absolutely nothing to teach them. Every day, some 6,000 girls in 28 countries of Africa and the Middle East are victims of this practice. No other animal on the planet would be capable of inventing something like this. A 
Among animals close to us in terms of longevity, intelligence and sociability, there are examples of much fairer balances between the two sexes. In the case of elephants, intelligent animals that can live up to 70 years, the family unit is composed of adult females and their children of different ages. All the females of a herd are related and the group is ruled over by a matriarch, who is the oldest female. Females will remain forever with the herd, while the males will have to leave shortly after reaching sexual maturity to live a solitary life. All, therefore, are daughters, granddaughters, sisters or cousins of the great matriarch. Between the ages of 13 and 50, the females can have one calf every four years. And when that happens, the little one is taken care of by all of them, who show true dedication in helping the mother. The baboons, too, have an interesting system. They have a very stable social order with two parallel hierarchies. Instead of a dominant male, as in the case of other primates, here a group of them rules, so that if one dies, there are no problems with succession. The social status of the females depends on their reproductive cycle, so those with young are automatically escorted, protected and pampered by the entire clan. The adults are extremely fond of children, and even the great warriors often play with them. Work is evenly distributed and each one has his or her function to perform. Having to survive on the ground, away from the protection of the trees, has made the baboons very much aware that the enemy is out there, not within the clan. They clean each other of parasites, a soothing ritual that strengthens bonds and avoids internal tensions between members of the group. No one lives at the cost of another. One of the most paradoxical relations between the sexes is to be found in the animist religions, which are very widespread in the third world. Women are considered a religious vehicle, in absolute equality with men. In spiritual ceremonies like this one in Havana, Cuba, both the medium and her leading acolytes are most often mainly women. For these animist religions, the spirits transcend gender and are neither male not female. All this conflict between the sexes, all this confusion and injustice stems from a biological reality which in its time functioned, so successfully in fact, that it made us the dominant species on the planet. The key lies in our children, the care of whom prevents many women in the third world from being able to choose their own destinies burdened by one pregnancy after another. Some 200 million women become pregnant every year. Half of all births are unplanned, and a quarter unwanted. Family planning translates into happier women, healthier children, and a more just world. Being the custodians of life should not be allowed to become a biological curse. After all, a mother is, first and foremost, a woman.